a huge pleasure to be um, back here. And I've come back several times, and each time I'm more and more amazed. And this time, I was completely um, bowled over as the taxi approached, because the whole place had been transformed. And of course, we owe it to Spenta, um, to whom we owe so much for, the, um, for building this institute, and also for his long uh, list of contributions to our subject. Um, Spenta, you're not only a very accomplished physicist and a brilliant builder of institutes, but you do it with such graciousness and such calmness and such friendliness that you are completely unique. And I'm just adding what everyone else has said, the long list of congratulations for your birthday, many congratulations. So when I was thinking about what to talk here, um, talk about here, I decided that I, um, I've given a lot of talks recently on the same subject, and I'm fed up with giving those talks, and I thought I would change, but I wasn't sure what to change to. Um, and that, so I decided in the end to talk about something that I've been thinking about, but with, where I've got very few new results, but there are large numbers of old results, um, namely um, trying to understand what one needs in order to build a theory of strings, hadronic strings, um, which has some chance of being connected with what one sees in experiments. So um, just uh, introductory transparency, we're talking about, um, in this case, I'm talking about the large N limit of QCD, and I'm going to be talking mostly about the pure young mill sector or the glue ball sector, namely closed strings. Um, and for many years now, of course, we've all been interested in the large N limit, which is something that has cropped up again and again in Spenter's life, this is the large N limit. It started by Tuft in 1973, um, which is where, where Tuft gave some very um, compelling arguments for why uh, QCD should look like string theory. Um, but of course, fundamental string theory clearly fails to capture many of the aspects of the string theory that we would like to have. Um, the most notable aspect, as far as this talk is concerned, is of course the fact that um, fundamental strings have no point like substructure. There's no parton-like structure, and uh, in particular, that means that the fixed angle scattering, elastic scattering or inelastic scattering, um, is uh, exponentially suppressed in fundamental string theory to all orders in perturbation theory, um, whereas um, physically we know that there is scattering point-like substructure, parton. Now, of course, for over the last uh, 19 years or so, there's been a, a large effort based on um, the holographic interpretation of gauge theories to try and understand how hadronic strings may emerge from um, by holographic reasoning. And to some extent, this has been very enlightening. In particular, um, this aspect to do with elastic or inelastic fixed angle scattering at high energies um, is at least qualitatively explained by uh, arguments due to Polchinski and Strassler and many others after them. Um, but to understand it properly clearly uh, requires un understanding holography in a region where it is simply not understood. A region of very high curvatures and actually um, also with quantum correction, so quantum gravity uh, in some sense. Um, uh, a similar set of proposals by Polyakov based on looking at the Louvre model also um, ha has the same problem. There's, it's not a good approximation for starting to try and understand uh, a weakly coupled um, description of a string theory. So what I'm going to talk about is an old idea, going back actually probably to days before uh, Spenter was, well, not before he was born, but before he was an undergraduate, um, which um, emphasizes the point-like structure. And I'm going to talk about this because it's something I've been thinking about again recently, but um, I don't have many concrete um, ideas. I'll mention some at the end. Um, so it starts from the observation I've just made that the fundamental string is a diffuse object with no point-like substructure, um, and that means for, that when one calculates scattering amplitudes and does the functional integral, the, the, the set of configurations of the string in which a finite fraction of the energy density of the energy um, uh, moves through a point um, is negligible. So what one would like to do, we would, one would like to um, re-weight the functional integral in some sense so that um, there are point-like energy densities. Such energy densities, of course, are not necessary, are not only needed in order to understand the um, fixed angle cross-sections, 
at high energies, but also, of course, the other, another important aspect of QCD is that unlike the fundamental string, it's crucial in QCD that QCD couples to external um, currents, electromagnetic weak and the energy momentum tensor, gravity, um, uh, and those currents couple locally. So in order to couple currents locally, one needs to have a formulation in which there are point-like energy densities to which the currents can couple. So I'm going to talk about this very um, old-fashioned way of trying to implement such a, um, uh, a, a change in the measure of the string. Um, my set of observations um, can, may be useful for other purposes, but they begin with the following, um, the following uh, statement. Um, let's consider how one might couple an external current to, to a string in a local way by talking about a, a, a form factor. So I'm going to use uh, some intu intuitive diagrams. Having intuition here means I'm going to talk about the physical gauge, the light cone gauge, and I'm going to talk about it in the, context, in the, in the, um, in the manner in which Mandelstam introduced um, his description of scattering amplitude. So this is the light cone gauge where the um, X plus component position is, is uh, proportional to the tau component of the world sheet uh, coordinates. And then the um, sigma coordinate is constant along the string, and its total value is P plus. So P plus is the light cone component of P. So I'm going to take a, a, a picture in which um, I take a string, a closed string is propagating from left to right, uh, but it starts at a fixed time, or fixed x plus. It's created by an external current, say, um, and then it evolves. So it's created at a point. This is a very singular state in string theory, and it's a state uh, which doesn't occur in the normal propagation of a closed string. Uh, but the string it creates can then split at a point A, and then the form factor is obtained by integrating over A. Let me put some coordinates on here. So I've got a, uh, the state is at the point Y, um, and the um, momentum carried by the external strings, P1 plus and P2 plus, um, are, uh, well, I'm using a convention in which all incoming momenta are positive and all outgoing momenta, so the plus components are positive. So the P1 plus and P2 plus are going in and they're negative. Um, and this is a picture which would correspond to what one would have if one had a boundary state corresponding to a D instanton in, in a more modern language. And we have to integrate over the joint point A. So this, is, this world tree is simply a disk with Dirichlet boundary conditions. But now, these are uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions in all directions. So the odd thing here is I'm taking a point in Minkowski space, fixed x plus, um, and then the boundary, along the boundary, x is a constant, so that the tangential derivative to the boundary is a constant, is zero. Um, and the coordinate is fixed on the boundary. Um, but that's equivalent to, to calculating a disk diagram where I simply set x equal to constant along the boundary. And I'm going to integrate over that constant, and then the momentum q is, the, is dual to that um, the x coordinate, and one can calculate a function f of q squared, which is a form factor as a function of q squared. And in the bosonic theory, one gets this answer here, which can be expanded as a set of poles in q squared. Um, however, it's divergent, of course, and one of the reasons for the divergence is that the bosonic theory has problems. That's the starting point. But now if I take that disk diagram, and if instead of having q plus positive, I look at a form factor, a space-like form factor, then um, there are two contributions to this form factor um, coming from that disk diagram. If I map the disk diagram back to the Mandelstam world sheets, I get one contribution which looks like a vector, what one would call a vector. Ah. Um, the first contribution one could call the vector dominated contribution, where a Q plus creates a closed string which then joins with the other the incoming closed string to form the outgoing closed string. But there's another component where um, there's an instantaneous interaction between the current, uh, the, the Q insertion, and P1 plus. Um, so the integral over A, in this case, is integrated from infinity back to zero, but then it goes through a right angle. And there's a finite fraction of the energy density in the string, which accumulates at that um, time. These two have to be added together in order to get the complete form factor. 
But now you can imagine looking at, a, at, at the limit in which Q plus goes to zero, with the zero, moment, the zero momentum limit of this. And as I said, this is a singular state that you're coupling to, so not, not surprisingly, taking the zero momentum limit doesn't simply give zero, um, but it gives... Um, But it gives a, a diagram like this, in which um, one now has a slit in the, the boundary of the disk is now, this is a um, periodic slit, um, where, which has some length that you're integrating over, which is the modulus is uh, um, analogous to the integral over A in the previous time. So one sees that the, um, this, this is a point-like insertion, which is required in order to describe this form factor at zero momentum. Um, and it's um, a point like, you can see it's a point like correction to the, print, to the propagator. And it's required if you want local coupling of the currents the way I've described. So the idea is that one could, one could this, this is a, a modification of the vacuum state of the string. It's a, it's a tadpole, if you like, it's zero momentum. And one can ins uh, un try and understand what the insertion of a gas of such points would do. But before doing that, one can now look at the scattering amplitude in the presence of such a point. Let me remind you, of course, that in these diagrams, in this notation, the tree diagram, the spherical world sheet, um, is simply given by a diagram of this type, where you integrate over the joining points A and B, and it's only the difference in the joining points which matters, and that's the integration of the single modulus that comes in in doing the um, tree-level scattering amplitude. The um, disk diagram is a quantum correction in this conventional theory, um, which has an open to closed string transition in it. And here you have to integrate over the length of this slit, <coughs> and um, that gives you the um, disk diagram correction. But both of these have exponentially suppressed fixed angle scattering. And it's very easy to argue, simply from the pictures, why there's an exponential suppression as the energy increases. It's basically that the points A and B never get close to each other on the world sheet as the energy increases. However, if you insert, instead of a conventional disk, you insert one of these uh, Dirichlet um, uh, boundaries, then everything changes. There's now a pinch when you integrate over A and B, so that although they, they never get close to each other on the world sheet, they get close to the boundary, and the boundary is mapped into a single point in the target space. So they're getting close to each other in the target space. So this diagram has fixed angle scattering, which in the case of the bosonic string has some power behavior like this. It's a function of the... Um, scattering angle with a power, power of dependence on the energy. So that, that's the key, um, the key observation, um, and it's a very simple observation, and it's a very simple calculation. So the question is, um, the question is, um, what happens when you, when you iterate this process and you, and you look at higher numbers of um, insertions? So now let me um, motivate that by discussing um, a construction of such world sheets in terms of a Hamiltonian. So now we've got, oh, we, I'm, I'm looking at an open string Hamiltonian, world sheet Hamiltonian, where the world sheet joins two points, x1 and x2. So instead of momentum space, I'm looking at fixed strings with endpoints fixed um, at points x1 and x2. And for future reference, I'm also looking at um, compactifying one of the dimensions, um, and, why, and a fixed endpoint string can wind around a compact dimension, in this case, n times. So this is the um, expansion, mode expansion for such an open string. And one can look at a, at a two-current or a, 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 an annulus diagram which represents two currents x1 and x, at x1 and x2. In terms of, I can look at the transformation from the annulus to the cylinder. I could calculate this as a trace over such open string states or as a transition amplitude between a boundary state um, corresponding to the um, a Dirichlet boundary state at one end and another boundary state at the other end with the closed string Hamiltonian in between. And these two have to be equivalent, and they are. Um, and the, as you, but in this picture, you can see that this, is, this, is, this represents a current um, at x1, joining, uh, creating a string at x1 and annihilating at x2. In a certain sense, you can think of this as E plus E minus annihilation. And it's dominated. Um, it, it can be expressed in terms of an infinite set of poles, because this propagator here um, has, uh, uh, gives you poles or singularities in x, x2 minus x1 squared. And these singularities um, lie um, inside the light cone, on the light cone. And unfortunately, of course, from the point of view of physics, 
There's one singularity outside the light cone. Um, so, um, but, but nevertheless, it's a tantalizing picture where you can see, just from the pictures, where the, where the light cone singularities lie. So there's a sort of duality here between the position space singularities and the normal momentum space singularities in the standard um, string theory. Similarly, you could discuss deep and elastic scattering, or something which looks like deep and elastic scattering, where you have two currents um, uh, interacting with external uh, glue balls in this case. Um, that will give you a world sheet looking like this. You've got two currents, x1 and x2, and interacting with the um, external states. Um, this is an angulus diagram with, with two um, external states, which may be ground states, in which case you could draw a diagram like this. And it's easy to evaluate such diagrams. And once again, you find that the q squared dependence, um, this is the forward elastic amplitude that's relevant for deep and elastic scattering, and you find that there's, it depends on q squared and q dot p, and the q squared dependence um, can be uh, calculated, uh, depends on q squared and q dot p can easily be calculated. And again, it's dominated by a series of holes, the same series of singularities that I drew on the previous transparency. So that there is some systematic way of trying to understand um, current amplitudes in this um, framework. If you now want to implement what I was saying more completely, you'd have to calculate something which is, of course, very, very difficult, which is you'd have to find out the properties of world sheets with, with arbitrary numbers of such um, boundaries. This is analogous to looking at higher loop corrections in conventional open string theory. Um, this, again, can be expressed. Each boundary is at some position, x1, x2, et cetera. So, that, so every bound, you could draw this world sheet as a disk with holes cut out where each boundary, each hole, is associated with the position x, and you have to integrate over all positions, but every strip here is a set of holes in, x, in the adjoining x squares. So this is exactly like a momentum space diagram, but each momentum is a difference of two x's. Um, and, then the, and, and then the large momentum behavior of any such diagram will be determined by the lowest singularity in in, in the difference of the x squared. So one example that you can look at um, as a simple, a simple, um, simple enough calculation to do is to look at the case where there are two such slits in, in a propagator, um, and then you, or in a scattering amplitude, and that um, involves looking at this diagram when there are just two x's. So this is again the annulus that I described earlier. Um, with two external particles. In fact, let me go back to that picture. In this picture, you see that there are, that the, there are two open strings joining P1 and P2, two powers of the propagator. Each propagator has a 1 over x squared. And so you can, um, you can easily see, just by dimensional analysis, that such a diagram is a correction, which in, is, is a, just like a loop integral. And in fact, in four, if you compactify to four dimensions, this generates a logarithmic correction to the um, amplitude, um, which is uh, with a lot of wishful thinking. That's, that's the kind of correction that you'd like to have were you to um, look at quantum corrections in QCD, which give you asymptotic freedom. But this is a, a, a very much a dual way of trying to understand that. Um, one interesting coincidence, perhaps, comes if you, try and, if you compare the um, results of this analysis with an old calculation by Porchinsky in 1991, in fact. He looked at the high temperature limit of QCD, but he looked at the high temperature limit of the confining phase of QCD in the large n limit. So in the large n limit, the, the, the deconfinement transition is supposed to be a first order transition, and there should be some sense in trying to continue the low temperature phase to high temperature. And when you do that, um, he looked at the, um, jump ahead a bit, Time, um, he looked at, a Wilson, at the behavior of the Wilson Polyakov loop, um, actually, a correlation function of two such loops. That that's, um, falls off exponentially like e to the minus ml, where m is, the, um, is a mass of a closed string state or a, uh, an effective mass, depends on the temperature, beta, of the closed string state in, in, exchanged between the two loops. That mass becomes tachyonic 
when you go to the above the phase transition, the deconfinement phase, and he estimated the um, value of the mass squared, so the mass squared becomes negative, and it goes like 1 over beta squared, um, which was a puzzle, because in, in fundamental string theory, you can look at the same process, the um, uh, exchange of a closed string between two fixed um, loops, and you find that the um, tachyon asymptotes, at, this is at small beta, it asymptotes to a constant negative number, not this, here it becomes singular. Um, so in, in, the, in the standard fundamental string, the asymptotic behavior at beta goes to zero is simply some constant. <clears throat> well, so I looked at this in the case that I'm talking about here, where there's a, a, a Dirichlet boundary condition. I've now, I'm now lo not looking in the um, light cone gauge. I, what I've done is stretch the world sheet so that the open string, so that the boundary goes from left to right, which means when you cut through it, there's an open string. But this open string has fixed endpoints, fixed at the same point in space time. And now I'm, I'm looking at, this is where the winding around the extra dimension comes in. We're looking at the temperature dependence at um, a value of temperature 1 over beta. Um, and you've got a propagator for the open string correcting the bosonic string, closed string propagator. So there's an insertion of an open string propagator. And the key thing is that this open string propagator has a mode, this is the first excited mode, which becomes singular in the limit beta goes to zero. So when n0 is 1, um, n0, when n0 is 0, that's the tachyon of the bosonic string. And I put this little comment here that in type, in certain string theories, in type 0 string theory in particular, um, there is no such tachyon. But in the bosonic string, there is. Um, but but, but um, when the state with n0 equals 1, is a state in which when beta goes to zero, sigma becomes large, very large. So that th this gives a propagator correction to the closed string propagator. So the closed string propagator is, is, is this factor, 1 over L0 plus L0 to the minus 2. Um, but it's, it's now shifted to first order in the string coupling constant by GS times omega. Omega is a weight for this boundary which at the moment I'm, I'm not saying anything about, but um, and then multiply sigma. So now if you look at how this affects the low temperature, the high, sorry, the high temperature limit, then um, it's clear that in the high temperature limit, since sigma becomes um, divergent, becomes large, um, this propagator becomes of this form. And then you can see that the mass squared becomes tachyonic in my, in my metric p squared it's positive when there's a tachyon. It becomes tachyonic, and the lowest mass, the tachyon mass squared takes this form, which is precisely the form that Polyakov found, uh, Polchinsky found for the, um, in, in QCD. Uh, but if, only if I identify the weight of such a boundary with a number of colors um, uh, in the QCD. Because the weight is actually, and if I identify the string coupling with g squared over 4 pi. Um, so there's at least some circumstantial correspondence. I don't know of any other explanation of the Polchinsky result. Um, there is some, there was an um, attempt to explain it in terms of the, the, rigid, the rigid string, but there, there are problems with that. So, um, that uh, okay, so that's a circumstantial connection with QCD. Um, there are lots and lots of questions, some of which I've been looking at recently. Um, so the question is, to what extent does the large angle scattering amplitude that I described earlier actually correspond to anything in QCD? And it's interesting. Again, the coupling constant dependence looks suspiciously similar. But whether or not there's a, a direct connection is very difficult to tell, because in order to describe QCD, you have to clearly not start with the bosonic string as the starting point. The generalization to the superstring, which is very far from QCD, is quite straightforward. And there are all sorts of interesting issues that arise, not the least of which being that the state I'm talking about in that case becomes the instanton state. And these, that's closely related to Yang-Mills instantons in the holographic uh, connections. Um, this issue of how to interpret the logarithmic corrections that come from the multiple insertions of these boundaries is something which is very uh, obscure at the moment, but I'm looking at that. Um, and of course, if one wants to look at 
compactifications, the four dimensions, there are very many ways in which that can happen. Is that the end? Um, I'm going to flash three more things on. Um, I've already suggested there might be a role for type zero theory. The type zero theory is special because it's, it's, it's formulated in terms of a world tree supersymmetric theory, but it doesn't have uh, space time supersymmetry, and in particular, it doesn't have fermions. Um, global states, closed string states in, in these open string states in QCD uh, obviously shouldn't have any fermionic, uh, shouldn't be any fermion states. Um, I'm, I could have said more about the open string sector, but I didn't have time, obviously. Um, and most importantly, of course, if this has anything to do with anything like QCD, it better not have any, anything to do with gravity. And so the issue about whether or not the spectrum contains a massless spin two state, something which um, is again very confusing. Uh, is the fact that that Polchinski found this this um, tachy the, the tachyon goes like t squared? Is that simply a consequence of uh, there being no other scale in the problem at very weak coupling? Could could we have the fact that the QCD is effectively effectively free or there's no effective scale? Uh, can you make a connection with calculations which were done on f for form factors in n equal four supersymmetric young mills over the years? Using this as a boundary seal? No, um, I, 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 I'm not sure what the direct connection is. I'm not sure whether the form factors they are looking at are directly analogous to what I wrote down. Um, were they called a singlet form factors? I think so, yes. They looked at Wilson loops, for example. Or well, there should be a way. Of, in that case, BPS there should be a state. way of trying to compare them. Um, and they looked at BPS states. The trouble is, of course, making a direct comparison with what I said is, is difficult because the, um, I was talking about the bosonic string. In the case of the superstring, one can make, do similar calculations. Um, the, um, but the, problem, <laughs> the real problem is that if, you look, if, if you look at any finite order, in, in, um, in these insertions, then of course you haven't shifted the spectrum. To shift the spectrum, you have to look at the condensate and understand why there are no, for example, in the closed string sector, um, there should be no graviton. There's certainly no gravitons in this for young milks. Um, so there's some way to go, I think, for details. Okay, I just thought that the boundary theory would give you all non perturbative effects of it. Of n equals four. I'm not talking about n equals four. Yeah, no. Are there any more questions? Yeah. So in, in, in this uh, picture of traditionally condensates, uh, suppose I consider two slits which join up. Uh, is that a is that a degenerate? Uh, does the world sheet degenerate at that point, or is it? Well, join up in what sense? So if it, uh, I mean, two slits could, uh, the two two slits could be they touch each other. Yes. So that's the limit in which one of the open string, so the slits are separated by a strip which has open string boundary conditions on each side. So um, that's the, that's the a limit in which there's, um, which will be sensitive to the treatment of the singularities that come in, in doing this integral. Like, it's like a loop integral. Okay, we are running late already. So let's thank Professor Gin for this talk.